Cheers in a way. Cheers in a way. Thank you. Thank you. We, we often, myself and Mary, often go to places and then. We never take any. We photos. never have a record of of any of it. I've been trying. Mind to you, we have pretty good memory, so yeah. it doesn't matter for so much. But, um, but we often uh, come back, and Mary says, "Oh, I wish I took a photo of everyone." <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, good for historical evidence, you know. In five years, we're all going to look ten years younger. So. <laughs> Or five years when you all dislike me intensely, <laughs> where I'll say, there was a time when you didn't, you know that. <laughs> uh, okay. This topic that has been a very hateful topic, shall we say, <laughs> or a very uh, contentious, topic. contentious topic, which we'd like to talk about for a bit in terms of earth changes and things like that. But what we want to do is be practical about the situation. So what we would like to do is talk to you a bit about some practicalities, about setting up some kind of learning centre that would be run in harmony with love. Now, what I would like to point out to you is that we have a website called godswayoflove.org, www.godswayoflove.org. And on that website, you'll find there's a constitution for an organisation. And, and that constitution is for an organisation that we're in the process still of setting up in Australia. We're still not hearing back from uh, the tax certain authorities uh, after six months, so that's an interesting thing that we need to work our way through emotionally. But um, that particular constitution can be modified to suit the setup of an organisation in any country. So um, what we suggest is that if some of you do have a desire to set up some kind of a learning centre in harmony with that constitution, so my suggestion first is to get that constitution and download it. It's uh, unfortunately 50-something pages long, so it'll take a little bit of reading. Uh, read the constitution. Now, anything in that constitution that refers to myself or Mary specifically can be removed. Right, But then whatever is left over would be a very good boilerplate um, of setting up an organisation that would then purchase any land required to set up some kind of a learning centre. So my suggestion, first, the first suggestion in practicality is if you are thinking of setting up a learning centre, obviously it's going to depend upon the, the country gonna... um, that we that the rules apply to. But so the first thing is we, we need to obviously select a country for the learning centre. So, so that's number one. So select the location. Now that location will be a part of a country that has certain rules about the incorporation of organisations. And my second suggestion would then be to set up a non-profit, not-for-profit organisation in that country. Now, whoever, many of you come from different countries around here. So some of you, you know, obviously in terms of the countries that will be a, a part of the future, that, which we will go through in a minute, many of you are from those countries. And so you can easily set up an organisation in a country when you're from a country. So the second step would be to set up an organisation. The third step would be then to... What it, to purchase land in an appropriate location within that country um, that would best suit the needs of a learning centre. And uh, there are some specific, um, what I would call, requirements for, for that, or what I would call suggested, su suggested options, if you like, for that. To purchase some land. And then the fourth step would be to slowly go through the process using the principles of the organisation to develop that land in a way that's harmonious with love. Does that make sense? So that's the general steps involved in what we're doing in Australia in setting up a learning centre in, or a number of learning centres in Australia. Uh, 
I want to pose a question about this. Sure. Uh, obviously, this organisation, we've placed in the constitution that we wrote, you largely wrote and I contributed to, we placed a lot of uh, onus on people's practice of love yes. and um, developing teams that were engaged in the discovery of truth, God's truth, and how to implement loving truth on the planet. Yep. So, this issue of the land, is that vital? Or can they start developing people and teams without the land? They, in the end, you don't need to set up any of these things until the purchase of the land is contemplated. Does that make sense? The purchase of a land is a legal transaction and so therefore must have a legal entity in whose name it must be placed. And if, it, if it's placed in a non-profit organisation, then it has a lot more safety in a lot of ways because the organisation has a constitution that's based on love than it is if placed in the name of a particular individual. Do, do you follow me? So, so the only time you need to worry about setting up the organisation is when you're about to purchase the land for the centre. I guess my point is actually the reverse of that. What's that? If... Um, I see the value in setting up an organisation even if you don't have land. This, I just want As long as you've already chosen the location to be a certain country because yep. each country has its own rules of About incorporation. So I just feel that there's a big... The reason this issue is quite contentious is because I feel there's an issue about survival versus desire. A lot of people are very scared about earth changes and wanting to survive and um, I feel that it's very important to focus on desire as we, as we keep talking about, yeah. loving desire. Uh, if you enter this process, this whole dot point process with a focus on survival, <laughs> I feel there's a, that's a fear driven process immediately. And you're not going to have very good results. It's not going to go well. Mm. If you focus, if you read the constitution, it's very much about love and desire and discovery and exploration. Um, and I feel if you, if you had that desire, if earth changes, I, ask yourself the question, if earth changes were not going to happen. At all. That's it. It's, it's a fantasy made up by some spirits and they keep telling the earth just to keep us all in a state of fear or whatever. Imagine that's the truth. Would you want to enter this process? Because if you wouldn't, don't do don't it. Don't do it. <laughs> yeah, it's really important. So yeah. I only do this because you're passionate about... Um, if you read the constitution of the organisation in Australia that we've set up, and that constitution creates some passion in you about setting up the same thing in your own area, then you'll, f you'll feel the desire and passion more for that than you will for earth changes. The reality is the constitution does not even mention earth changes. Does that make sense? And it's very much about developing souls rather than developing land yeah. and, and that is crucial. Yeah. Yeah. So what I'm doing here is listing the practicalities of the process yeah. but, but what Mary's mentioning are the more soul-based things that we need to be concerned about, about the process. Does that make sense to everyone? So, so um, obviously the first step, if you, before you set up an organisation you need to choose the country in which you're going to set the organisation up. And, and most, com most countries um, do have a requirement, like some countries, for instance, most countries in the European Union are governed by similar laws in the setting up of constitutions, but, but other countries are not. And so we need to actually find out the particular laws involved before we set up the organisation itself. My suggestion, though, first is to read the constitution that we currently have for the organisation that is being set up in Australia. It's available on the website, so it's, uh, if I write up top, it's www.godswayoflove, God's Way of Love, or one word, dot org. And actually, we're already in, we're basically um, implementing the principles of the constitution of the organisation, even though it's not legally totally formed and in Australia there is not yet we're down to this point yeah we've not yet purchased land or we've not yet had land donated to the organization because 
at this stage, we have yet get, got to get tax exemption for the organisation. And so we're waiting for that before land. There are some land that bit different people in Australia have earmarked for the organisation, but they don't want to give it to the organisation just yet until the organisation has complete non-profit status. But the development of teams and of people is definitely... And a number of people who are here with us from Australia are involved in the teams uh, uh, associated with the organisation in... Um, that are endeavouring to learn and be of service to the earth and to spirits. Yeah. Yeah. So the organisation can get operational and start doing things even without any land. Does that make sense? But, but because we do want to at some point purchase land, if we're going to set up a learning centre, we want to have a location where we start developing the entire principles of like environmental, the environment principles and other principles, then eventually they will want, you'll want to go ahead and purchase land. So you want to set up the organisation in the location that, uh, that you're thinking you're going to finish up purchasing the land. Does that make sense? And, and when that organisation is set up, it can have directors and members, and the members decide what the directors do, the directors decide the direction of the organisation, but under the terms of the constitution that we've set up, it's a very much based upon love, and this is why I suggest you read it. Um, in particular, read sections two and three of the constitution, in particular those two sections, sections two and three of the constitution. Because they are the main guts of the constitution, <laughs> like the, the thing that's, uh, that will tell you almost everything that guides the organisation. And if that doesn't inspire you, then don't do it. <laughs> if those two sections do not inspire you, then don't go ahead with it. Does that make sense? It's pointless wasting your time and resources and effort on something that you're not passionate about. That's the, that's the key thing to remember. So in practicalities, we obviously need to choose a location, then set up an organisation, and then the organisation be can become operational in the sense that different people can come along and we can have create different teams. In Australia at the moment, we have nine teams that are currently operational and eventually there will be 17 teams that are operational of people. And, and uh, do you want to list some of the things they're involved in? Sure, yep. sure. Yep. Do, do you want to know what they're involved in? Yeah, yep. yep. Um, so uh, what some of those... If we rub this bottom bit out bottom for a moment, because yep. we'll come back to that. So some of these teams... Um, these teams are dedicated to learning. They're all about learning. So we have a mediumship team. We have a construction team. We have an um, uh, environmental team. So all of these teams are interested in pursuits in these areas that are in harmonious with God's love and truth. So the members of this team are passionate about mediumship, developing mediumship, learning about different types of loving mediumship, uses of mediumship, loving uses of mediumship and so forth. The people in this team are all about developing buildings and, and other constructions such as energy devices and all other sorts of things that are all harmonious with love as well. So that's what that team's about. This team's about developing the environment in such a way that's completely harmonious with love and truth and the principles of the soul and so forth. There's an arts team. The arts team is all about music, uh, art, music, uh, visual arts, performance, and a lot of other things related to that as well. Just had a little spider jump on me, isn't he cute? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> then there's production team. The production team is all about produ producing the presentations that you're all receiving. So, um, so Igor and Lena right now are doing things that the production team is all about. What else? Is it? Uh, there's uh, a records, records team. team. Yeah. The records team uh, was established to create a record of every single thing possible that we could investigate. So the records team is involved in all these other teams in some way, recording what they're doing and recording the results and therefore giving them an option to change depending on what the results are. Does that make sense? And also it gives us a method then of putting things on, um, 
keeping records about all sorts of things like even like plants and and how they germinate and all these other types of records that we're going to need in what the future. What are the other teams? The events, events team is a team that uh, actually looks after the organisation of events like this. So they look after the organisation of, um, se of doing seminars and workshops and all those kind of things. Communication team, we've just started that one up in Australia. And that team's looking at uh, how we can... Um, help people in the wider community be um, aware, of, these aware of all of the things that are going on. So it's sort of like communicating to the world about divine truth. So they've actually starting an uh, internet uh, radio, station. radio station and TV station in order to sort of basically have interviews and everything that will be eventually available on the internet and so forth. And that's the communication team. Eventually, the communication team wants to set up a radio mast and a proper radio transmitter and everything as a part of their uh, team. That's their passion of their team. There's a hospitality team. The hospitality team looks after, like, when we're doing construction events, the hospitality team prepares all the food for that event and get, you know, helps everything come together with regard to food and, and so forth so that so that the people in construction can focus on construction and then they can come and be fed and looked after. And they and so also forth. host people who might want to visit different teams. They also like host that. others, yeah. yeah, in that team. Um, I think that's all the ones we've launched so far. The uh, Soul team, we it's have not, not yet yeah, really that's got nine started. That we've so started. They're, the, they're the ones we've started at this point. And there are, another, there are still another um, seven or so other than this that we want to get started as well. But they are the ones that we've started now, and every one of these teams have members. They have a team leader, and then they have a team secretary who keeps the whole team informed about what's going on. And then they have a team membership. And the membership of each team is confidential in the sense that we want to... If a person only wants to be in one team, doesn't want to be in the other team, then they only receive emails or updates from that team. That's all. We don't want people getting spammed, spammed you know, with, with unwanted emails and unwanted uh, events and so forth. So um, at the moment, to give you an idea in Australia, like there's around 50 people who are a part of the mediumship team. Um, the construction team, there's around uh, 20 or 25 people. How many did you say is in the environment team? About 80 in the environment More. team. Yeah. The arts team, I think there'd probably be a 40 or 50 as well again there, wouldn't there? 50, yeah. Yep. And a person can be members of any team they want to be, so they can be members of more than one team if they wish. And so what we do also is we are starting to create events that relate to different teams. And some of the events are fun days, you know, fun times, but other events are actual work times, you know, where we're getting a lot of work done. So the environment team, for example, has actually already learnt a lot of things in Australia and they're already starting to apply a lot of those things on their own properties and they're already starting to be... They're almost ready now to start working on the learning centre land with all the things that they've learned um, over a period of, of, what, probably be six months or so now that it's been going... Pretty close, when it. Dennis is the leader of that team in Australia at the moment, so that's why I'm asking Dennis these questions. Um, so th these different teams all have, uh, and they're all just focused on learning. The whole lot of them are just focused on learning. And these te these teams, not the name of the teams, but the actual uh, guidelines regarding the teams, are in the constitution. So the, the constitution is outlines the guidelines of each of these teams. Does that make sense? So the practicalities are that you can get set up if you've cho chosen a location but you do not have the funds to purchase any land in that location and you set up a constitution for the organisation, there's no harm in now setting up different teams and starting to do things, even if those things happen to be between, you know, via email and via, you know, electronic means to communicate with each other. Um, the beautiful thing about, and I don't know how the members of the teams that are already... I think everyone here from Australia is already on at least one team. Um, the beautiful thing about it for me is this, is this is an opportunity for us to start practising the principles that AJ and I stand up here and talk about all the time. 
with each other. In a practical environment. In a practical environment. What does it mean to experience God's truth in relation to the environment, in relation to communication with spirits? How do I work as a member of a team using the principles of the divine love path? Because many people come and they come and listen and then they go out into the world and they go, yeah, but how, okay, what's more important here? Is it truth or what are, you know? And this is very much a, an environment where everyone has the same goal. We want to live this practice and it's very challenging I, I think some of you would agree um, at times to go to be confronted with whoa okay this is the loving thing or this is I can feel where I've still got an injury around this because even this person who we both want to be on the same path and we're, we're confronted with what's resistant so maybe us. we can give you an example of like yeah. in the environment team um, we've been using our property as a lot of like an experiment at the moment uh, with the environment team just because it's a smaller property and if it gets damaged at least the big property won't get damaged. So, so basically we've been using our smaller property and if it gets damaged we're fine with that, we can fix it up later. And so what we did is we, we've been having the team meet every Tuesday and one of the Tuesdays they come along and I said we want to build swales down the side of a dam wall to cover up the dam wall which was just bare, bare ground and nothing was growing on it and it the dam wall itself the outside of the wall the dam is just a water dam so it keeps water in it but the outside of the wall was just bare and no water was staying on the wall and it was eroding so a lot of erosion was happening there was no grass on it or anything like that and we wanted to do something with that so I asked all of the team members we just talked about swales as a bit of a theory and I asked all the team members to be a part of digging a swale. Do you want to explain what a swale is? A swale is like, uh, if you think of a hill normally going down like that, a swale is like an area that it will catch water in it, in here. So, so instead of all the water running down the hill, water will be caught in this area here. And it will seep. And it will the seep way. down the hill under the ground. Mm. And then if you have another swale like that, and that one's catching water, and another swale, obviously the whole area can catch a lot more water and therefore we have a chance to grow things there and, and cover it with ground cover and then eventually trees and so forth and plants. So it's a way of keeping the water on the land and also a way of stopping erosion. So I then leave the team and out the team gets there with their picks and whatever and starts digging these swales. We come, I come back about an hour or so later and, uh, and I look at all the swales and they're all terrible. So I tell all the team they're terrible. <laughs> so the big emotion comes out there, but you know. And then, and then we sit down and we discuss why they're terrible. What's going on? Like what, what? Most of the swales would never have kept water in them. So that's what makes them terrible. They, weren't, they were dug to hold water and none of them will hold water. So that, that's no good. So we talked about then the emotions involved while they were digging. And a lot of people found that when they dig, because of the physical labour involved, they just go out of their body. And they're no longer caring where the hole gets dug. They just go, oh, I've got to, got to do this, you know. And, and so a lot of them were feeling like detuned from the entire process as a result. Some were feeling competitive. They were looking at the other person's <laughs> hole and, <laughs> you know, trying to make their hole the same or different depending on what the competition dictated. And, uh, and there were lots of different emotions involved. So what we did on the side of the dam was we just sat down and we talked about the emotions involved. And then I showed them a swale that would hold water and also was created with love, you know, created from a heart that really wanted to have this whale working and, uh, desire and desiring. So, so once we did that, then everyone could see the principles involved and then they changed their swales to, to suit that same kind of principle, taking care, you know, we talked about different emotions of not taking care and so forth. And everyone can start feeling then the different emotions affecting just what they do with the, just a basic thing, like digging a hole, and how many different emotions we have or avoidance of emotions that we have in that process. So, so that's just with one little team and one little example. There's been many examples that we could bring up, but that's just an example of what the kind of things we do. So it's not just about getting things done. It's about learning you know, what's going on in my soul that causes me to do this, physically do this as well as learning in the process. So and many in the team have learned a lot of things in the process. The same applies with every other team, you know, everything that we're doing with these teams. Now, everything in the organisation, because it's a non-profit organisation, 
the constitution of the organisation states that we're not allowed to solicit funds. Do you know what I mean? We're not allowed to solicit for funds. In other words, we're not allowed to ask people for funds. We just wait until we get donations. And once the donations are large enough, then we go ahead and do something. Right? And all products of the organisation are gifts. Um, and given to others yep. and not given just to the members. Yep. They're given to the wider community. So what we're trying to do is set up events and everything that is given to the wider community in that region. Um, so, for example, um, the arts team want, want to set up a, uh, a performance where they're singing, dancing, doing little skits and all those kind of things, a performance night for the general community in a nearby town. And so they're having auditions and they're doing all the work to get all that happening. The uh, construction team is looking at methods of building in, in a bit more harmonious methods than we've, we've been using in the past. And, and also in le learning how to work together as a team rather than all everyone working separately, you know. And so every team has uh, different things going on with it at home at the moment. Now, these teams can be functional, as I said, without the organisation owning any property. But what's happened in Australia is that some people have come along and said, oh, you know, wouldn't it be great if the arts team had a sound system so that they could all get up there and play their musical instruments and a big audience could come in and listen to it. So, so one person donated some funds and myself and Mary have donated some funds and to that team and now that team, we've bought a sound system for that team. So now the team has a sound system that will eventually train people how to use from the events team and w once they know how to set it all up, they'll be able to take that sound system from place to place and do things with it uh, to do their concerts and stuff that they want to do. So eventually what happens, because of the enthusiasm of members of the team and the enthusiasm of people leading the organisation, eventually donations come along eventually that enable the organisation to get things done. And, uh, and so, in the end, um, it can work very well. But the directors of the organisation have to be in a good condition of love, loving their environment, loving people. And, and uh, I'm still mentoring the directors in the organisation in Australia. And the members of the organisation, at the moment, on our, in our organisation in Australia, there's only two members, myself and Mary. Uh, they're the only two members. We're the only two members. There's not really a need to be a large number of members, but eventually we would like to have 30 or 40 members. The problem with having large member is that you've got to have someone maintaining a member database, and nobody likes ever doing that generally. <laughs> nobody generally likes computer work, particularly when they've got all these other interesting things to do. And so we're trying to keep the memberships quite small. But that, but the teams are, can be as large as we want. And uh, the teams, eventually what we're hoping is that different members from these teams will be able to travel to different countries and help the members of those teams in those countries. Does that make sense? To learn the things that those, the members of the team learnt in a different country like in Australia or something like that. So we're hoping to actually disseminate a lot of the, what the, lear the learning that has happened in one location to another location by the willingness of different members to travel from one location to the other and help the team in that new location get set up and going. So that's the general, general gist, gist of things. Does that make sense? How does that sound? Right. Well, the key is to look at the constitution because that's the thing that governs everything with that. Mm -hmm. So in terms of this discussion about the Learning Centre, we must first understand um, what we're creating and to understand what you're creating, my suggestion is to create what, like the, what the constitution is that we've written because that constitution is very focused on love and very focused on truth. When you read it, uh, I think you'll feel that it's very, very focused on those things. But then the next selection is to worry about where we're going to put such a centre because obviously the organisation can't be set up in a location uh, until we've chosen the location and therefore know the particular rules of that particular country in order to set up the organisation. So this is where it gets down to a uh, discussion about the potentialities of what's going to happen in your region. 
as to where is the best place to set up something. Okay. Does anyone have any questions before we start that? Yep. Can we have the microphone over? Uh, the only question I had is, um, it's very Anglo-Saxon focused, or is it not? I mean, how, what about people, the Spanish world, Greeks, um, non-English speakers in general? How do you propose to get in touch with those people? Because I did see a communication uh, team there. Yes, and there is a lot of work underway at the moment to translate these talks into other languages, subtitling. Yep. Uh, Lena and Igor have been working um, with another couple here in Greece who I'm not sure if they still want to work on it, but... Um, uh, on I'll work on that if you yeah. want me to. Yeah. yeah. Great. Yeah, what we're trying to do is uh, there are many nationalities at the moment of people connected with uh, the path who understand English, but they also have a language of origin. So there are Russians, Sw Sw Swedes, Swedes, Norwegians, French, French German, Greece, Greece. Spanish, Greeks, Spanish, South American. South American. So mo all that would be mostly Spanish, Spanish Portuguese, and and uh, you know are uh, also Japanese uh, and, and some other nationalities as well, all associated with the divine truth. And what we're trying to do is just engage them with their desires, if they have a desire. Many people have expressed to us, oh, I I want to get this to my friends at home. Um, I'm happy to translate, you know, and so. There's been some transcripts created in English of um, key talks, the key talks that are in that gift pack that we've given. We're focusing first on that, those yep. sort of six key talks. If so you like. there's English text and then that is then able to be given to people. Who uh, are bilingual. Yep. And, and they then they can translate those into other texts. At the moment it's all volunteer based on people's desire, you know. Um. And this is where we see some advantages in setting up uh, in specific locations around the earth because obviously the organisation when it gets set up in that specific location will become whatever the primary language is in that location, will di dictate what then happens generally. And what we're hoping to see in the long term is, is, is learning centres in many different lo locations around the earth. We're hoping to see sort of 12 to 20 around that figure of learning centres around the earth, all uh, speaking different languages, but all able to connect through different people who are bilingual in order to get everything up and running in a new language and new location. So uh, while at the moment it's focused on the desires of the people who are in Australia, who are obviously all English, um, speakers, yeah. Uh, English speaking, um, we we want to see it grow into all these different uh, locations and also languages as a part of a part of it. But that's very because everything is done by donation. In other words, everything's done voluntarily. Obviously, we've got to allow for the fact that there are you know people have their day to day lives to lead as well, and therefore some things that we would normally get done really really rapidly if we were all working at it, obviously are going to take a longer time when everything's done voluntarily. And uh, for some people, um, are volunteering like uh, Igor and Lena, for example, uh, are volunteering their time all the time. And what we do there is we put their names on, uh, on our website with a way of donating to them so they have a way to live. Um, but other people are working, obviously, still and have, um, have businesses and, and other things going on. So um, those people might be able to donate less of their time and therefore it might take a longer time to translate things and so forth. Yeah. yeah. There's a number of people really in Australia working on that issue. But yeah. yeah. Um, I believe on YouTube already, there's a, is that, did anyone check it in Greek? Does it, is it? Is it? Needs a lot of work. Needs a lot of correction. Some languages are not too bad on YouTube where it does translate a majority of the language into the new language without much effort, but other, other ones we're going to definitely have to subtitle uh, in, a, as a complete language. So um, if what we're, what we're doing is we're just relying on people from that language to tell us, oh, it needs a lot of work or whatever, and if that's the case, then we need to have people who are versed in that language and in the English language to translate the two. So it's a bit of an operation, but particularly it's an operation <coughs> based upon desire but also an operation based upon voluntary effort. So everything is voluntary effort, so obviously it takes a bit longer to get those things established. Yep. Mm -hmm.
Is there any other questions about, about that? Okay. Yeah. Far away. Yeah. Thank you. Um, just to uh, ask, because, well, I'm in Europe, so there's nothing still happening here. Um, if we, let's say, I have an interest in environment or recording, because I do, mm -hmm. um, would it be valid to start collecting some information and maybe communicate to, I don't know, I guess everything is on the website or something? Become a member of the team. Just uh, in, It doesn't matter where in the world you are, you can become a member of a team anywhere else in the world. So don't, uh, don't you can become a member of any of those teams that we listed. Um, and then... Um, then you'll receive the emails uh, about those teams, unfortunately, at the moment in English only. Yeah, um, but you can communicate again with the leader of that team and if you're collecting things, you can communicate that as well. And yeah. also um, follow, if you want to, you know, what they're putting in place so it, in the end it seamlessly comes together. Yeah. And do a yeah. similar thing in, even in your own country, even if there's no teams, because th a lot of the activities that we're engaging in don't need a team of people on the divine love path, as the saying goes, to do them. Like they can, they can yeah. involve with anybody. So, so the reality is, you could set up a little workshop of your own in your own country, even if there's nobody else there. If you're passionate about it, learn some of the methods from the team, and then teach that to the people who want to attend it. And if you do it voluntarily, eventually things will start to gather momentum. Yeah, okay. does that make sense? Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so the question then becomes, um, what are the locations that uh, we would want to consider for a team in Europe? Now, obviously, um, we, want, we want the location to continue to exist after Earth changes. Right? So, so if, we, if we just pick a location that's convenient now, um, and then, but, but it's not going to be a location that... Uh, survives earth changes very well then obviously you know it's going to be very very difficult for the for it, for the organization to continue running and also the location to continue after that point I'm just fading a bit I need to, here i'll check you, you want to just check me yeah. no you still got Am three I still bars. wound up yep <laughs> no, <it's good> <laughs> okay so um so what we want to do is make sure that we choose the appropriate location now there are many, many governing points about the appropriate location in your area of the world. You Not, see, yeah. um, can we discuss some of them? Yes. We should preface everything <laughs> with... Um, none, of, none of these things are confirmed. So we want you to feel about what we're going to discuss now rather than just accepting it as... That's what it is. That's Truth. what it is, yep. because we want to go through the process of confirming the details. However, um, there are definite, definite things we do wish to consider in the process of setting up a learning centre in any location. Um, one of the things we want to consider is, is that location going to be close to major seismic or volcanic events? Now, as I mentioned in a previous discussion, all the way through here, is all going to be close to seismic and volcanic events. So obviously, choosing a location anywhere through here, so we're talking right, all the way through basically Turkey, uh, Greece, all the way through the uh, countries near Greece, Italy, the, around the uh, ranges, the Alps, and then all the way through the ranges that go through Spain, all of these areas are going to be high, highly seismic because we have a feeling, and we've had a feel, I've had a feeling for a long time, that actually Africa is going to move up yeah. and compress this area and therefore cause lots of stress. So for that reason, you can see that it's the areas up here which are obviously a bit more favourable just from the consideration of seismic events. Right. The other thing is the, there is the potentiality, and we've felt even for a long, long time, uh, that the, of the earth tilting back into a more upright condition. So, in other words, where what is currently the Arctic Circle and the Antarctic um, will change. And, uh, and, in fact, we feel it will move northwards, and therefore Europe will probably move southwards. 
and twist as it goes. So there's sort of a twisting moment. moment. So where Scandinavia may end up down here and Spain sort of down here, twisted, twisted in, with all of Africa pushing up. Right? Now, if that does happen, then we've got to consider things like, uh, you know, during that period of time, how livable is the location that we're choosing or selecting? Because if it's not very livable, then we'll have to go to it afterwards rather than go to it uh, beforehand or setting anything up beforehand. Thirdly, with the movement of the earth, there will be water flowing. Some of the water, it will depend, if the earth tilts upright, whenever it tilts upright, how it spins and the speed of its spin will determine, uh, to, a, to a large degree, will determine the um, momentum that it has. Now, the momentum is going to dictate how much force is implied across the oceans and therefore how much water will be flowing across the oceans from one place to another. And the spirits have indicated to us at this point in some discussions that some places on the earth the water may be as high as 1300 metres high moving over land. Other places it might be as low as 200 metres moving over the land. It just depends on the location. Right? And it depends on how it does as to which direction, so uh, as to which direction it actually moves, as to which direction the water will move, whether it's going to move southerly or northerly. The, at the moment, the feeling in your region is that the water will move southerly, down, funneling down south through the Atlantic Ocean. Now, obviously, any island is going to have difficulties under those circumstances, and you can see, obviously... Um, England um, is definitely a very low island, particularly in the like, e England portion of the island. You know, north is where all of the uh, mountains are. And so a large amount of that land is obviously going to be inundated with water, along with some of the other islands and so forth. And also a lot of the coastlines will be inundated with water as well. As to how deep, we have not yet confirmed. But if we're selecting a location, we need to take in consideration that. Um, there will also be, uh, potentially, over a period of the next three years, a melting of the polar ice, both the Antarctic and the Arctic. Now, um, if that does occur, then potentially, and therefore Greenland, uh, Greenland will also have no ice on it, um, if that does occur, then the water level could rise potentially anywhere up to 60 metres all over the earth. So where we're standing right here, right now, would actually be underwater if that actually occurred. Right? So, so we will need to also factor in that as a part of the, 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 the feeling process. And then we also need to factor in what I would classify as man-made potential events. For example... All the way through Europe, there are literally a hundred or so nuclear reactors. And uh, potentially, almost all of those nuclear reactors are going to struggle come earth change events. When I say struggle, many of them uh, will not be able to be uh, contained. The, the nuclear process will not be able to be contained. And some of them will go into a nuclear meltdown and others will be able to be contained and maybe not have too much of an effect. Many of the old reactors that you have in Europe and in Russia um, have very poor designs with nuclear containment and therefore a high likelihood of causing nuclear radiation problems. Um, some of the newer reactors have very high levels of nuclear containment um, and so therefore have less of a potential of harming a large portion of the environment. But nuclear reactors are very dependent upon cooling and are very dependent on pumps operating to keep the processes cool. A single reactor, for example, nor normally takes 28,000 litres of water per hour to keep cool. And, uh, and therefore they need pumps to pump them and if there is earth changes and if there is no longer any diesel, which is the backup pumps, and the nuclear reactor isn't itself working, then there's no supply of coolant to the reactor, which then provides a lot of additional problems. 
So that, that bearing, in, bearing all of those in things in mind, obviously locations near nuclear reactors are, are going to be, uh, depending on where they are, whether they're safe locations or not, uh, are going to have some degree of effect on the choices that we make. Now, for instance, in Sweden, there are four, four uh, currently operating nuclear reactors, as far as I'm aware, and uh, one of them is in Copenhagen, one of them is in Stockholm, and uh, you also, I think, in Norway, have one nuclear reactor, which is an experimental reactor. You don't actually have any operational nuclear reactors in Norway, as far as I'm aware, but that is in, near Oslo, so there is another... Uh, nuclear reactor there. So there are nuclear reactors all around this region here in this location. You also have all the way through Russia many nuclear reactors. Uh, remember um, Chernobyl? Um, the Ukraine, which is um, here, uh, this area here, isn't it? Igor? Yeah. That's the area, isn't it? Ukraine? That's where Igor comes from. Um, Chernobyl was the very top of the Ukraine, is right near the border between Ukraine and, uh, what is it, um, Belo Belarus. Um, and so th that particular nuke reactor went into meltdown. They've now since closed that reactor down. But, but from there, they first measured the radiation in Sweden. Hmm. When I say they first measured, obviously Russia knew about the radiation but didn't disclose it until Swede, the Swedes measured it. And then, of course, they disclosed that, yes, we had contaminants. So you could see that there were fallout issues coming towards the north and also the flow. Obviously, the Earth is ro in rotation and so, therefore, to the, to the west. You have a question, Katarina? Would the wind then be a factor on this one? Um, with any form of radiation, it depends upon a number of factors, again. Um, it depends on what kind of cores are used in the nuclear reactor as to how the reactor explodes or how the reactor goes into meltdown and what contaminants... So radiation has... If radiation attaches itself to the core and the core is a graphite core, for example, then you have a lot more, you have a lot more ash and smoke from the reaction meltdown and therefore a lot more contaminant can travel further as a result. You've seen how from Iceland... You've had a volcanic explosion and eventually a lot of the air traffic all the way through Europe was closed down. It's the same kind of principle that weather systems, of course, can move the contaminants all over the place. Now, as I said the other day, uh, we don't have to... The truth is the body is able to cope with nuclear radiation if it's in a space of complete no fear. But the chances of, all, of us all getting in that space before one and a bit year, or one year's time... Uh, going to be fairly low. So for that reason, we need to choose carefully where we, where we choose to do a learning centre as well. So can you see there's quite a few factors to consider, isn't there? Yeah. There's all these potential earth change event factors and then there's also potential man-made factors. You know, for example, if we're near a city and the city uh, and, and the, uh, there are earth change events, and that city survives, then there will be large numbers of people without power, without water, without food in that city. Now, the question then becomes, with their, continue, with their particular unhealed emotions, what would they do under those circumstances? All right. Now, many will become potentially violent under those circumstances and survivalist in their, in their attitude. And so, you know, obviously setting up a learning centre near a city like that, within short walking distance from a city like that, might not be the advisable course of action either. So can you see how you need to choose, determine quite a number of factors? And this is where there's so many, there's so many different factors that at some point we're going to have to start at trusting our spirit friends. Do you see? Because it's hard for us on Earth to actually factor in all of these different constraints. There's and so then many know variables. The there's so there? many variables. There's things that we not we can't be sure of. Yeah. Really. yeah. Does that make sense? Christina, you had a question. Thank you. Uh, will the sun be a factor as well? Like um, well, obviously, the amount of heat coming from the sun will be a issue. 
because uh, if the supervolcanoes do go off, and there's a high likelihood of this it, it, uh, Italy supervolcano going off first, then obviously the region will be very rapidly covered with ma major amounts of dust and ash, which automatically blocks sunlight from getting through. Uh, volcanoes, particularly supervolcanoes, create their own weather systems as well, so uh, that also blocks the sunlight from getting through. And so large areas of land in Europe will possibly be in darkness for anywhere up to a month, in fact. Um, so that, of course, is going to have an effect on food production, water, in particular water, you know, what, what's going to happen to the contamination of water, and so forth. Many of you in Europe are very reliant on uh, water being available to you naturally uh, in, in dams and so forth constructed for the purpose. And as a result of that, um, obviously those water supplies would be contaminated and therefore uh, not able to... And there's no way of filtering that water anymore because there's no power. And so, you know, you, you have the issue of no power and contaminated water and no sun. So what do you do to filter this water? Obviously, one of the only methods is to boil it and then, and then condense it. And, uh, and that in itself is going to be difficult if there's no fuel. Um, can you see? So there's all these different considerations. I, Nico, you... Because I have lived with uh, condensated water for a long period of my life during my trips. Yeah. Uh, okay, I can survive, but I mean, in order to get the thirst out of my body, I need at least two liters of water just to take the thirst out of my mouth. Even because we mineralize it, so we put minerals inside, they're not sufficient. It's not like water. Yep. It's better to purify normal water uh, via filter system by wind generator or whatever. I agree. But However, uh, that might not be possible, you see. So, so the reality is that you may have to have condensed water uh, in order to just have water to drink. So th these are... It would be even better if you had a safe water supply that was constructed before these events occurred. That would be even better, of course. So, but these are all considerations. What I'm doing is just listing the considerations. Does that make sense? Some of you are going into fear as a result of the considerations. Uh, I don't feel any fear about these considerations, but I'm just listing the different considerations that need to be a factor in, in where, how you would choose a location with regard to where's the best place to set up something that will have some longevity. Mm. Um, Dionysus? Sorry, uh, I'm not finished with you. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry, Kirsten. Yeah, uh, to make more clear the question, will be the explosions on the sun that it will affect the Earth and the magnetic field? Um, that is unable to be predicted, but, um, but the, the same cosmic radiation that's going to be affecting the Earth affects the sun. So, yes, the, we are now entering a, a period of high sunspot activity on the, on the sa surface of the sun, and as a result of that, uh, our weather systems are very dependent upon the sun and the extremity of our weather systems are dependent upon the sun. So there will, and we must expect there to be, extreme weather events during this process. Mm. And also the magnetic field might be unstable and... Yes, the like effect of the magnetic field switching poles, though, is a lot less than the pole, the actual surface of the Earth shifting. So when you say the magnetic field shifting poles, there, are, there may be effects in terms of the, the, sphere, the spheres of, of air above the Earth and the magnetosphere and the, and the ionosphere and the other, and the other areas of, uh, of, um, of ba bands of gases above the Earth. But, uh, but usually, historically, um, due to the records that are available in the Antarctic ice caps, the, there is an indication that while, those, while the switching of the Earth's magnetic field may occur, that it doesn't cause major damages to the Earth as much as the actual Earth moving. If the Earth moves, then we're talking about major issues. Um, there are some religious people who predict that the Earth will stop rotating and then start rotating in the other direction. Um, scientifically, the logic, uh, the logic of that is very low. Um, because uh, if the Earth stopped rotating, it's now travelling at a close to a, a 15 or 1,600 kilometres per hour on the surface. If it stopped rotating, it's got to slow down and stop and then 
start spinning in the other direction. <coughs> now, just to slow down and stop, you imagine the momentum that would be required to do that. Is it quite extreme? But for it to slow down and stop, and the argument is that this body, some of you have now taken photographs of a body which is double the size of Jupiter just passing the sun. Have you seen those photographs? Yeah. Yeah, the, um, Caroline has got one of them on her own camera, if you want to have a look. All right? Where there's a body twice as large as Jupiter travelling past the sun, and you can see the body in the, in the sky right next to the sun when you take a picture of the sun. It's hard to see with your naked eye because you can't look at it very easily with your naked eye. Some people feel that that body will pass the Earth and then cause the Earth to stop spinning and then start spinning in another direction. If that happens very rapidly, then most of us would never survive it. Because to stop from 1,600 kilometres an hour to stop to zero in itself over a period of one day means that we're stopping at 80 well, you know, if you divide 16 by 24, you get about, about 80 kilometres per hour. That means we're stopping at about 80 kilometres an hour, decelerating at 80 kilometres per hour. Now, for most of us, that would mean getting flung into anything that's around us and instantly being killed as a result. You try hitting a car at 80 miles an hour. Right? And so, of course, the uh, buildings around us are also slowing down at that speed. So there's a chance that we might not hurt ourselves as much. Yeah. But the reality is the stresses on the buildings would be so great that uh, you know, it's highly unlikely that many or, any, or many or even any of mankind would survive that kind of event. So if we have to worry about that kind of event, then we're better off being in the spirit world, basically, because uh, that's where, where it's going to act. So, but also the logic of that isn't very high either of that actually occurring. To have the Earth stop within, uh, within a few days and then spin in an opposite direction requires very, very high gravitational pull. And to have that occur, you need a very, very large body right near the Earth for that period of time, slowing the Earth down in its rotation and then causing its rotation to go in another direction. And and generally, gravitational pull doesn't work very much like that either. It's the, it's the weakest force in the universe, gravitational force. And so, you know, the likelihood of that occurring is fairly low. So the reason why I bring that up is that that's a theory that many religious movements are postulating. We actually saw on the internet the other day a imam from uh, a, Muslim, a Muslim man describing the event... Um, mm -hmm. However, there are many people who believe they see two suns or other things like that. And that is certainly possible um, if you think about a, planet, a planetary body passing us. And that is certainly possible. And in fact, there is a planetary body right next to the sun right at the moment. That, that's right near the sun. Um, all of these things will have an effect on the Earth and, and of course, where, where it's safe, if that makes sense. So now we've got to, because of what I'm trying to illustrate here is there are so many factors involved in selection that we've now only got one tool available to us really and that is our feelings. <laughs> and having this ability to channel information from our spirit friends as to where we should be looking. So when we, when we went looking in Australia, um, I just had a very, very strong feeling, no that location there feels really good to me. And that's it. <laughs> and then we go to another place. You, you were also concurrently very attached, uh, very in tune with your personal desires, yes. your relationship with God, yep. love yep. and truth. Yeah, of course it wasn't just <laughs> as simple as that. <laughs> yeah. but, but of course when you're in touch with desire, love and truth, now we have the... Um, you know, ability to connect to our spirit friends. We have the ability to channel information from them and have feelings from them. And quite often we can get feelings when we walk past the thing. Oh, I've got to stop and go into there. Or I've got to... And, and that's the feeling I had when we drove past the land that we're looking at for a learning centre in Australia. Two of them in Australia, actually, we've had that feeling. I've had the feeling on a number of locations in Australia, the same kind of feeling. And I feel that eventually many of those locations will eventually become learning centres as well in the longer term. So what somebody needs to begin doing, if they're really interested in this, 
is to travel some of these places and go through, not do a normal tourist thing through these places, but to travel some of these places and feel. Feel the process. So some of you who are in these different countries need to go to different locations in these countries and feel about them. So for example, with Sweden, it's, well, from an Australian perspective, it's quite a small place, right? <laughs> so we understand that from a European perspective, it's quite a large place. Um, but obviously, there, are, there is a bit of distance between the top and the south and the north. Go for a drive. Right, for a few weeks and feel different places and let yourself feel the different things that you feel. Um, as you do that, you'll get a sense of, okay, no, this feels good here for some reason. And note down all the places that feel good for some reason. And then still exercise your desire and see what comes up as a result of noting down the places. Does that make sense? But obviously, if you've got a nuclear power plant here, nuclear power plant here, a nuclear power plant here and a nuclear power plant here, which is... Now, that particular region there is, is quite covered, isn't it, by pro possible and potential man-made events. So while that might be the seemingly best location at this point in time when we drive through it, it might not in the long term be the location. And this is where we need to start trusting our feelings when we go for a drive. It's the same through Russia, through the Ukraine, Russia and through the other so ex-Soviet Union um, <coughs> lands, all the way through to the Urals, it, it'd be great to be able to travel through there a little, perhaps, and, and get to know the places a little bit and feel about them and what do you feel drawn to. Also ask yourself, who comes from where? Because it's who comes from where that is very interesting. A lot of times it leads you to a location that you would not normally have gone to. And that would be my suggestion, is to go through those locations and do it, you know, just f go by feeling rather than trying to decide. We, we feel, and I, I, probably more I feel at this point, Mary's, Mary's a bit more guarded. Um, <laughs> I'm pretty blocked on this issue. Yeah. Um, I feel that any place through here is going to be relatively safe except for man-made events. So the problem with Russia is that it has a high number of nuclear reactors and some of them are very old and so therefore um, potentially quite dangerous. Um, the same goes with the Ukraine. The Ukraine actually has the largest nuclear reactor in Europe uh, in one location and, uh, and there are some, but there are some areas of the Ukraine, ironically up near Chernobyl where the where the last uh, nuclear explosion occurred. If you go, if you go towards the west, um, sorry, towards Certainly. the east of Chernobyl, um, in that location, there might be some areas in there that are quite uh, safe in the long term. Chernobyl is no longer operational as a nuclear power plant. Um, but you can see all the way through Europe, you've got the issue of how close are you to a nuclear power plant. Um, the reality is there's nuclear power plants all the way through um, Europe. Now, some of these areas in Europe are going to be quite safe seismically. So, in other words, they won't have much of a shake-up. Uh, therefore, um, you know, they, they may, even the nuclear power plants may survive and actually be operational afterwards and be relatively safe. They'll run out of fuel eventually because there'll be no uranium to drive them, but at least they'll be safe from external contamination. Uh, whereas other locations are very much more highly seismic and uh, the, there's a larger potential of damage in those locations and therefore a higher potential of radiation, particularly if they do not have very, very hard contaminant vessels. A contaminant vessel is the vessel that contains the nuclear reaction and uh, keeps it under control should an accident occur. So again, my feelings are just go through the areas. I have some feelings about different areas there, but my suggestion is to allow yourself to go through the areas and feel what you feel as you're going through those areas. So if any of you do have some funds available and so forth to be able to do a bit of travelling over the next few months, my suggestion would be to do a bit of travelling through these different areas and see what you feel in terms of a potential learning centre location. Does that make sense? Eva? Yeah. Yes. 
Um, I was just going to ask you again about the timing, actually, because we've heard some about October and then some about February, March 2012. So if you would like to mention that. Um, at the moment, the, our spirit friends are indicating that the serious events uh, would happen around about February or March 2012. Um, however, we can't say for certain the timing because in reality there are so many variables there as well. In fact, even your own soul condition is a variable in determining the timing. And the better condition we get into may actually delay the timing quite, quite substantially. So, and when I say we, I mean collectively we get into a better condition of love that certainly affects the timing of events as well. So it's very, very difficult to actually say the time, but at this stage um, it would appear from what our spirit friends are saying that there's at least nine months of time. To be frank, feel... a lot can be done in nine months. Mm. We don't have to set up the place. All we need is to choose it and maybe get some water on it you know, in terms of non-contaminated water, and, and we might not even need uh, resources other than that to survive in those particular locations. So, you know, we don't need to build houses and all worry about all those other things, really, in a lot of the locations that could be used, possibly, because there might be resources around us that are all available. The key is getting the resources available. So preparation can be done with the resources. So really important things are water, Shelter, food. Everything else really becomes secondary to those things. But this is where if the teams engage their desires and passions, it all naturally happens. For example, in the environment team, in Dennis's team in Australia, a number of the team have a passion for collecting seeds. They just love the idea of collecting seeds. So <coughs> one of them is so passionate about it that she's buying some... 40 foot long shipping containers, which are the largest shipping containers, that are insulated so we can store seeds in, in them. So, and she's already starting the process of contacting different locations and different botanical gardens and all sorts of things around Australia looking for seeds, looking for a supply of seeds. A supply of seeds for food, but also a supply of seeds for, for animals as well and birds and so forth, so that we can grow the trees and we have a large variety of trees after events and that's all happening because of the desire of, a, of certain members in that team. That's the only reason why it's happening. There's no other reason. We heard there's a really big seed bank in Norway. Uh, there's one Norwegians. in a, this island up here, Somewhere. isn't it? Or, or is it there? Is it? I think it's there. Uh -huh. It's uh, Sarsgad, is it? Is, is it what it's called? Sarsgad? Um, it's way, way up in the Arctic Circle, in ice, and, um, and they've actually put a big worldwide seed bank there um, where, where I think something like 40 or 50 countries have actually provided seeds, and Australia is actually one of them. You, you actually have seeds there from Australia in that location uh, up there. Yeah. It'd be nice to be able to be close to that after <laughs> the changes, because... <laughs> Might be able to get some of those seeds out of there and plant them, eh? Um, so that, that's an interesting... Yeah. It's just an interesting fact that that's, that's the only worldwide seed bank in the world. <laughs> in that location up there. Yeah. So, um, now, can you see too that many of the considerations at the moment will have to be discounted? So some of, the, some of the considerations that you would have, for instance, in Sweden are here you're in the Arctic Circle, right? And so therefore... You, you no longer have a clear definition between day and night at times where you have, you know, day for a, for a whole month and, you know, night for a whole month at portions of the year. And most people feel like they don't want to live in such a place because they get quite depressed. <laughs> but, but come changes, that location might be in a different space and therefore, you know, be a completely different thing. And this is where we're going to have to be very, very open emotionally to the impressions of our spirit friends. You get that? Because if we're not open emotionally and we're just making intellectual decisions based on how the world looks now, we'll choose a location not very well. But if, we, if they, our spirit friends, have a good idea of how the world is going to look after changes, they have a good idea of how things are going to feel after changes, where they're going to be safe, what kind of climate, all those kind of things. And as a result of that, they have a much better idea 
of you know what would be the best location and we don't yeah um, uh, there's a there's a common injury when we look at land to um, go for comfort to go to comfort what can this land give me and this is um, why I stressed at the beginning this idea of God's way of love, the organisation, the principles involved in it. This is very much about what can I give to the land? How can I repair the soul damage in, in myself and the effects of the soul damage that has been placed upon this land? So, um, so some of our spirit friends, we can feel are very keen for us to choose land near Chernobyl. Yeah. They keep uh, him, that's the, I, I'm so blocked to this issue, I can't pick up anything except that. Does that make sense? Some of our spirit friends are very keen for us to do yeah. that. Now, what, that might feel very illogical to us, yeah. but the reality is if we have the tools and techniques and we have the spirit information about how to very rapidly tidy up that land heal it. and heal the land, that could be a, a wonderful learning thing for the rest of the world. Do you see? So land, you know... Most of us would never consider that, and yet our spirit friends are going, yeah, yeah, we want, you know, we'd like that to be one of the locations, sort of thing, nearby, nearby that location. So isn't that interesting how, how that's the case? So we need to have a very, very open mind about it, because if we don't, we're not going to receive, we're going to receive this inspiration. And can you see when you're coming from a position of fear, you're like, oh, what can the land give me? How can I survive? How can I, you know, it's all about my protection. Fear is driving that whole process. If I'm open to the possibilities of my soul, of God's potential, of, of oh, okay, I'm going to step into this process and it's going to be about exploration and growth and discovery, no matter if it's here or in the spirit world, if I'm in that level of openness wow then I'm going to, my guides can really impress upon me where there, there's a location that has the most potential for me to demonstrate the principles of God's love and truth so it's a very important that your emotional state that you're aware of your emotional state and how it's driving your decision making mm. yeah mm. I know I keep harping on about that <laughs> but oh, no, um, I feel it's really important yeah it's very important Obviously, if you wanted to go south of Europe, there are going to be a lot of safe places in Africa. <laughs> um, but uh, we're focused on um, what safe places are available to you in this, in this region, I suppose you could say. Are there any questions, uh, Nico? You want to say something? The microphone's coming. What about uh, the southern part of Russia? Will it survive the coming changes? Um, the beauty of Russia in a lot of ways is that it, it's, it's landlocked on three, three sides, pretty much. And so um, if you look at it, if you look at it um, according to what our spirit friends have talked about already, there will be large amounts of water coming up the um, Indian Ocean. Now, the low-lying areas... Uh, on the top of the Indian Ocean, obviously will be inundated with large amounts of water. But you notice through here, there are mountain ranges all the way across. Now, that provides a natural buffer. You know, the water's got to get over that to cause damage north of that. Now, here, obviously, there's, there's two seas, the Caspian and the Black Seas, but, um, and the water from them certainly will also, if, if, if there is a southerly push towards the north, then the water might come up through, through that area, but if there is a rotation in this direction, it might stay relatively stable. So again, we've got to trust them, our spirit friends. But you can see there's the ranges from the bottom, there's the ranges of the Urals, and there's also a lot of ranges through here, and this is where Russia is. Now, can you see there's a fair bit of protection, isn't there, from all sorts of events, and also... This area through here is a relatively stable earth plate in the sense that they don't have as many uh, seismic events through this region. Lots of seismic events through this region. Very few seismic events through this region. That being the case, um, obviously there's a lot of protection afforded to, to Russia, even other parts of Russia, but of course... Parts of Russia may actually go towards the pole and become even colder. But remember I said that all the polar ice will probably melt in the long run anyway. So 
um, in the end it will still be a sunny location, although you might have sun for a few months of the year instead of just you know, a day and a night type of th thing going on. In other words, it's going to be in the Arctic Circle at some point, or the circle that we receive sun all the time. This region here is still probably not likely for that to happen. It'll probably rotate downwards and move downwards a little. And as a result, uh, looking quite a safe area all the way through there. And in fact, this is why they, our spirit friends seem to be implying that near Chernobyl might be a lo good location for a number of reasons. You've got... The Ukraine is here, isn't it, basically? you got some of there. Um, <laughs> Uh, Odessa oh, is there. It's all in Greek. I uh, <laughs> just trying. It's all in Greek, so I, I can't read Greek. So, no, like down here, isn't it? Ukraine. So Ukraine yeah, here is somewhere. No. Ukraine is this area here, though, isn't it? Where is it, Lena? That's Odessa. That's Odessa. Odessa. And the Ukraine goes up and around, and and Chernobyl is around about. It's north of Kiev. Yeah. That's Kiev, isn't it? It's about 400 k's north of Kiev, isn't it, uh, Chernobyl? So Chernobyl's around about there and move across a little, about there right, on the map. Now, you can see that that's qu over, you know, 1,200 kilometres from, from a sea, quite, but it's a smaller sea, and uh, that's not very deep. So I think it's only about 1,200 metres deep at its deepest, the Black Sea. And, uh, and you can see that it's quite protected from all sides, and so... It's not such an illogical location, aside from the fact that everybody <laughs> thinks of it as a radioactive wasteland. <laughs> right? And so, yeah, there's a potential in the Ukraine, southern Russia, all the way through the southern Russia area, Nico, yeah. Been to southern Russia, but uh, near Black Sea in Novorossiysk, and I remember seeing the trees, and I felt a call. But that was three years ago. Yeah, yeah. Four. This is why it's so important to go to the locations rather than just guessing it on a map. Go to the locations and feel, you know, feel your way through it. Feel what the spirits are telling you in different locations. And, and many of you are mediumistic. Many of you are mediumistic. You're able to go to a location and receive messages about different things in that location. And, and my feelings, my personal feelings are anywhere through this region is going to be relatively safe in comparison to other places. Yep. And one thing I consider about that area, because it's Russian Federation, if I remember correctly, it's so huge that it's very easily to buy some land, you know, as an organization. I don't know as a... It's very easy to buy, to buy cheap buy land. land. Yeah, yeah. You know, you don't yeah. have big resources because it's so huge. Very easy, yeah, very easy. So that's the beauty of uh, these countries, um, too, that, you know, we, we can uh, do many good things in these countries. The other advantage in Russia, I feel, is that there, are, there is a large movement in Russia towards spirituality. Yes. And that to me, that's a very positive uh, thing about Russia, very large movement towards spirituality. And if I can add also, I, I, I like, because uh, Russian people, in, not in big cities, but in the country are so, you know, in the old ways, and I love that. Yeah, yeah. They are so simple, and they're so honest and true. And yeah. I love that, because yeah. I miss it yeah. in me. Yeah. Do our Russians agree? <laughs> <laughs> Do you agree with that assessment? Yeah. 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 Um, there are, obviously, like any nationality, uh, cultural injuries that will drive a person's actions. However, Russians uh, often... Uh, particularly for the last 15 or so years, used to living in an environment with less law because there isn't the money to maintain law. And because of that, um, what you get is... what you see is what you get in terms of soul condition. Does that, does that make sense? Whereas in other countries of the world, what you get is not what you... What, what you're getting is not actually the soul condition but a modification of the soul condition because the law is telling them to do something different. For example, in the USA, there is a large amount of law. But you imagine for a moment, all of a sudden, chaos, no law in the USA. Every second person's got it, or every person pretty much has got a gun, or every family has. Um, you imagine now the chaos. Um, the chaos from a country like the USA could be much greater than the chaos of a country like Russia, 
because in Russia has been through chaos. So they're already in the state of their real condition. Does that make sense? Not, we're not faking a condition in, in many of the locations. Yeah. Thank you, Eva. Sorry. Um, no, she's got, there's two. It's, it's all right. She's got one. Yeah. Uh, I was, um, mm, I have to catch my thoughts again. I was thinking about how to teach on the learning center because you've been the teachers in the first uh, learning center. What we're trying to do with what we're doing in Australia is we're hoping over the next few months, uh, as people have been learning, you know, different, the different, uh, um, we spend a lot of our time with the team leaders, so like someone like Dennis. I spend time with Dennis fairly frequently. Um, and the, what we're hoping is that the team leaders will exercise some of their desires to actually, once you set up a certain location, that they want to go to that location for a short period of time perhaps and help people in that location set up a similar you know, have the same kind of learning that they've already learned. In other words, people giving to other people the lessons they've already learned. And the other thing we're doing is we're, because of the recording sessions and the events, the, uh, the production team, we're able to record a lot of the teachings and place them on YouTube immediately. So that means any other learning centre in the world can then just look at that thing and go, oh, we can do that. And does that apply to our location and so forth? And some things will and some things won't. But they'll be able to take on a lot of that teaching and lear learning through that method. So we have a lot of options over the next 9 to 12 months of getting information, mm -hmm. as much information as we can, to every person that we can who's willing to know the information through, this, through the internet technology that's available to us. So we don't even need to be in the location. To, to be able to teach a lot of the information. But one of the really key principles that we've stressed with people is that the best teachers are very good learners. <laughs> they're humble to the fact that they don't know everything and they're in a process of continuing to learn, just as AJ and I are in a process of continuing to learn God's laws. And so it's that humility um, that is like a cornerstone of leadership in God's way of love. So... Um, and in it's fact, that's built into the Constitution. Yep. We actually built that principle in the Constitution that the leaders need to be the people who are the most willing to learn, yep. not the least willing to learn. Not the people who think they know everything, but rather the people who are the most willing to learn everything. And, and not from us, from God. From God, yeah. every, from the... Yep. You know, from, from, their from their experience, from everything. Yep, yep. yep. So, yeah. so, so if you choose team leaders in any location, then of course... They need to be the most humble person who is dedicated to the path of getting closer to God and getting closer to themselves and who are in a place where they're humble to learn and they become the, better, the people who are better teachers uh, as a result of their desire to learn because they are good examples of mm. what you need to do if you want to progress. Yeah. Is that, is is that, is that yeah. yeah. So yeah. the combination of all of those things and then the, and the travelling of different members of different teams discussing what they've learned and then and also you, what you see on different uh, presentations and so forth that you'll be able to examine, um, some of which have already been placed on YouTube, actually. Um, you'll be able to learn many things, even if you're not connected to us in Australia. Now, obviously, as, uh, as Pear, I think, mentioned, after changes, it would be great to um, have a method of communication. However, the speed of those communications are going to be very limited because of the technologies that will be available to us. And so uh, we need to be, by that stage, not reliant on each other, but reliant on the truth that's already in us now that we've learnt over this period of time. And this is why myself and Mary, our primary focus still is to deliver as much truth to every person before events occur. So that's our focus. That's what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. So we will not be spending huge amounts of time with individuals, but rather we'll be spending time, as much time as possible delivering as much truth in a wider variety as we can. And then we're hoping that if uh, change events then occur, there'll be people in different locations with that truth in their soul who then can t help others with that truth as they, as they grow. Does that make sense? 
Yeah. Yeah. It's a, a huge task. Yeah. For all of us. Yeah. But you don't need to be frightened of it. You know, God, God's the one who's got everything under control. So, you know, you just, you just put yourself in God's hands and away you go. Yeah. That's right. So we, we don't have to feel like, oh, I've got to get this happening. I've got to get that happening. I've got to do this. I've got to do that. And we've just got to take and, the first step into we, desire. Yeah. That's and we, all. we don't want to end yeah. up in a panic trying no. to do all these things yeah. and in the process not actually growing towards God. The, the, goal, the goal is... Grow towards God, grow towards your desires, grow towards truth and be, deal with as much fear as you possibly can between now and changes. Because right? it's the fear that dictates how you go. It's the fear that drives everything. Blocks the blocks, truth, blocks, the blocks, truth blocks inspiration, blocks yeah. love, blocks guidance, all those things. So mm. deal with as much fear as possible. So myself and Mary's focus is to besides our own condition still, is to help everybody receive as much of the truth as we can possibly give them in this time. Mm. Yeah. Nina? Hello. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'll, like I understand it's going to be a very slow process depending on people's desires and, and, and everything. A very slow process? To do a learning centre in Europe. I don't feel it has to be a slow process. See, de desire, is, um, desire is very powerful. You, it collectively, if you have a desire in one direction... It gathers momentum. It gathers quickly, momentum yeah. very rapidly. Yeah. Especially so, if it's purified desire. Yeah. The problem is, is that, yes, there is a potential that it's not purified. In other words, you know, for example, to give you an example, the people in Greece have their own... Axe to grind, as the saying goes. The people in Sweden have their own axe to grind. The people in Norway have their own axe to grind. The people in France have their own axe to grind. And, and they've all got their own emotional injuries involved in, we want it to be in our location, we want it to be in our location. We want, and now, is there a collective desire in one direction? No. There's now a dispersed, competitive desire in all different directions. Now, obviously, if that happens then yes, things are going to be very slow to develop. It just depends on how you act in love together and also whether you all have a common viewpoint. And this is where I say to you, read this constitution if you haven't already done so. That will help you have a common goal, a common viewpoint. Does that make sense? Yeah. For me, being in Australia and seeing the teams and what is your plan, I really... That's one of my real desire to learn more, mm -hmm. and I've seen how it's so challenging. <laughs> and um, and I've connect with Eva and some people who have a desire to to do this too. And I was wondering if that would be helpful to give an email address where we could just maybe collect or like organize, be more organized, and maybe connect with you or. Yes, but but you see. What the problem is at the moment is everybody is expecting me to organise them. No, I'm happy to give my own email address on the video and then make a, a list like you do in Australia and be the secretary or whatever we can call it. Just yeah, to but, but if I can it. say what I was going to say. Yes, um, there is a large projection at myself and Mary constantly that we need to drive everything. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to engage your desire so that you start driving some things. So you don't have to wait for me to organise something, but, but if you, the things that we do organise, myself and Mary, we definitely want to be harmonious with love, right? And so what we do is, given our circumstances and personal situation, we offer correction or whatever to the people who we feel are out of harmony with love. Now... Now, but, but we can't do everything and we can't organise everything and we can't communicate with everything. Um, and this is where we're activating our desire and our desire is to get as much truth out there as possible and also I've already written the constitution of the organisation that, that is available for you to examine and to engage your desire but, but do not expect myself and Mary to be constantly involved in the process. There will be times when we will feel like we need to be with regard to helping people work through emotions that seem to be blocking a process. But, but anybody can do these things. However, when you ask me to put my, your details on a website, 
that is now involving my time. And my time at the moment, as you can ima maybe imagine, is very, very busy doing lots of different things. And, and, I, and I'm not going to be able to add more and more things to my time. And this is where um, we need to engage our own desires in terms of setting up things between each other and so forth. And I, I'm happy to see those particular things happen. Um, you want to make a comment about it? No. Though? no. It's just, just do you want to... Do you want Nina's email address now? She's and offering it right now. Yeah. To, to put on the whiteboard and maybe the people who look at the... Sure. Yep, yep. Then they can email me and, and I can take the list of the people here and whatever. Sure. Yep. Yeah, yeah, sure. What's okay. your address? Oh. <laughs> uh, Nina, so N-I-N-A. K-A-T. Double T. Double T. Double T, sorry. A at Yahoo. Yahoo, sorry. Does it? At Yahoo. So Kata at, at Yahoo. Yeah, yeah. At Yahoo. Dot F R like France. France. Yeah. So yeah. anybody who wishes to communicate. Yeah. And, and what what are you feeling they should communicate with you about? Maybe just a desire just to to start to have just a list of the people then when... Who are interested in ha having something happen? Yeah, and yeah. then like um, with the... Like if someone wants to go and travel and if... I don't know... Like so you can start coordinate any travelling that may occur? Yeah, for yeah. communication Good. based or whatever and then it would be probably much easier because we're in so many different countries. Yeah. And I... I, I and you really want to have... Uh, if there's going to be organising of some travelling, you really want somebody who's... A fairly connected to the earth and also connected to some spirit friends who goes along with the travelling. Like, to if you're going to select location, you know, you, you want to be connected to your spirit friends and also connected to uh, the earth around you before you make a choice of where to build mm -hmm. something. Myself and Mary would love to talk with, the per with you as a group when you have options. Does yeah. that make sense? But don't expect us to tell you the options. Allow yourself to feel your way through these options. This is very important, part of your development. So it would be more to have a group and then when we start to have a desire or whatever and we feel things, could we still ask you for your guidance? So, sure, sure. We're happy to be involved in that, but we're not going to drive your desire. Does that make yeah, sense? Yeah. We're going to wait for your desire. That's what myself and Mary always do with every single thing. Um, even the team leaders didn't happen because uh, Mary and I went, oh, we'll choose that person. What happened is that person generally chose themselves through desire and we noticed their desire and then we went up to them and said, oh, you've really got a strong desire in this area. So this is what happened with myself and Dennis. I said, Dennis, you've really got a strong desire in this area. You really have passion for it, don't you? How would you like to be the team leader of that team? <laughs> and, and he has his initial panic and whatever else and then he relaxes into that process do you, do, do you see um, but he demonstrated his desire over a period of time before then uh, not by talking to me about it but by acting upon his desire that's how he demonstrated his desire and that's been the case with every one of the leaders of these teams every one of them have acted on their desire for a period of time and we notice their desire so there's another young girl called Ivana who we see very passionate about the arts you know she She's, she'd organised sing sessions with people. She had less projection coming from her of neediness about it all. She just enjoyed doing it and so forth. So we went up to Ivana and said, Ivana, how would you like to be the leader of the arts team? But that was after she had demonstrated her desire. Not to us, like she hadn't even talked to us about it. She just demonstrated it through her day-to-day -day life. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's the way, that's how we chose the leaders of the team. Like we have another team leader, Gary, his name is of the construction team. Now Gary is just passionate about the land and passionate about building things. Like, and I've noticed this in Gary over a period of two or three years that I've known him. And so he's quite a shy man, you know, like quite reserved and shy. Uh, but I went up to him and said, Gary, how would you like to be the leader of the construction team? And he had the same feeling that Dennis had, you know, initially. And then he's starting to really enjoy the process uh, now, so... Yeah, so this is how each team leader was selected in, the, in each team. Um, the way the communications team leader was selected was Raj, his name is, came to us and said, 
you know, I, I reckon we've got, to set up a, we've got to set up a radio station. I badly, badly want to have a radio station. I want a divine love radio station, you know, and he, and, he, and he was just really passionate about it. And in his life, he has demonstrated his passion many times through by setting up things and organising things. He's, he's quite a good organiser as a result. And, uh, but, but he's always had a passion driving it, you know, like behind it. And so he said, Raj, you're a good person for the, com for the communications team. Would you like that? No. <laughs> <laughs> he, so and then he I had to think about He had to have a think about that. Yeah. But, uh, but then he realised that as long as he can have his radio station, he's happy to do anything <laughs> he wants. <laughs> so, so this is how the team leaders were selected uh, through their desire and passion. And they demonstrated not to us, they didn't come to us and say, oh, look, I really want to do this and I want to be that team leader. They didn't do any of that. What they did was they actually put into practice their desires uh, over a period of time before we ask them. Does that make sense? So what we're trying to do is choose the people with that desire to do the thing rather than, rather than try to make somebody have a desire for that particular thing. And this is the situation you will face in your location. You, you've got to be careful that you're not pushing people to have a desire that they don't have. Right? The key is to engage your desires and passions the way you wish and then see where it falls, you know, like in terms of what happens. So some of you do have a desire for travel, some of you do have a desire to have a learning centre in the location, so act upon these desires, use your resources to act upon these desires and investigate. Travel to places that might be, that you might, that you feel led towards. Uh, allow the spirits to guide you to these places and we can certainly give guidance in that regard but we don't want to push the desire of a person. We don't want to push a person. What we want to do is we want to help you engage your desire and passion and then we want to support that passion and desire that you have. That's what we want to do. And we want to help you refine it so that it's more loving. That's what we would like to do. That's what we feel our role yeah. is. Sort of like mentoring. Mentoring sort of a role. Does that mm -hmm. make sense? Yeah, thank yeah. you. So certainly, engage those desires, have a look around. There's a lot of travelling that can be done. Travelling is fun. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Dennis. Uh, yeah, there's about the uh, multicultural um, event. We've been, we've been doing it in Australia with so many different nationalities. Yeah. Okay, might have been practising for 200 years, but it's, it can happen with yes. the desire. Yeah, um, yeah. So that's quite a... Uh, yeah. Australia is a very multicultural place by nature, isn't it? Because we have so many immigrants from all over the world. Um, but also many of the visitors who have come have brought in yeah, their language and so forth, uh, like just in this process of creating the organisation and creating the teams. And that's been pretty good too. So y you can cooperate together even though you have different languages... And, and, and different uh, cultures and so forth. As long as everyone's acting in harmony with love, yeah. it all works through quite, quite easily. The key is when you start competing with your desires and when your desires are out of harmony with love, there's a tendency towards competition. Mm -hmm. When that starts happening, then everybody is like pulling in different directions. You, you imagine this is a great big rock and this is a heap of ropes off the rock, right, tied to the rock. And we're trying to drag that rock along the ground. And this person here decides that they don't want to pull it in that direction. They're going to pull it in this direction. Right? Right? And uh, this person here decides they don't want to pull it in that direction either. They're going to pull it in this direction. Can you see what starts to happen? The chances of this thing happening with every single person deciding on their own right about where they think it should go, become less and less and less until we end up with everyone pulling in completely opposite directions. And at that point, the rock is just going to stay still completely. Mm. In other words, nothing will happen. So what I'm saying to you is if nothing happens in the next two months, it's because all of your desires are pulling in different directions. Babe, is it worth just talking about... Don't rub the rock off. <laughs> Don't rub the rock off. 
about how if this person is in um, a lot of anger and mm -hmm. control mm -hmm. and these people over here haven't dealt with their fear, mm -hmm. how the rock can end up being pulled in a very unloving direction. Of course. <laughs> you understand analogy. what Mary just said. So, yeah. so if there's a heap of fearful people who are all afraid of the angry, uh, angry person, right? So there's a heap of fearful people here. They are all willing to pull the rock in this direction. Right. So this is a loving direction. That, and yeah. that's the direction of love, let's say, yeah. for the, for the organisation. If we say the rock's the organisation, right? And that's the direction of love. But this person here is in a direction of, is in quite a lot of resentment and rage. And, and they are used to controlling people through their resentment and rage. They are going to be yelling at them and telling them they're wrong. And, you know, that, and eventually, every one of those persons, do you think they're going to be pulling in that direction anymore? No. The easiest thing for them to do is to pull it in the direction of the person who's angry. Right? And what do you end up with? You end up with the organisation being directed by the most unloving person. And this is what commonly happens in communities and different organisations. This person maybe isn't overtly in a rage, but there might be a lot of suppressed rage or a certain injury that they're holding on to. And if these people, obviously there's a law of attraction at work in every group, mm -hmm. if these people are carrying a lot of fear or placating emotions towards that, that they're not willing to deal with, you, you end up having the control placed with the person who's most willing to use fear and, or anger to, to control. That's mm -hmm. why... These principles that we keep talking about and the love issue, that are the, the humility, they're just so important. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Does that make sense to everyone? So, so if you find over the next period of three months nothing happens, then it means that either the desire isn't real in many of you or many of you have a desire but you're all pulling in a different direction. And if that happens, my suggestion is get together as a group and talk about it as an issue. Does that make sense? Like, talk about it. If you want something to happen, you are going to have only, it's only going to happen with a collective common desire. Right? That's the only way it's going to happen. Yeah? If we go up to Nico. And can we just have a time check as well? Just because we have. Yeah, it's ten, uh, ten past seven. Uh, eh? okay. ten, ten to seven. seven. Oh. No wonder I feel yeah. tired. Uh, yeah. I would like, I don't know, but it came to me naturally. You know, the, we people that we are in Europe, I think we should write our, at least our, our emails or uh, how to contact each other so we can... Well, if yes. you contact through... Nina, Nina. She, she's going to create... I understood she's going to create like a mailing list yeah, so that when some... Oh. So if you just email <laughs> Nina, then you all know who, where everybody is, who oh. whoever's interested. And then you can, if you want to, if you want to communicate with the rest of the group, you can. Were email. you outside smoking, Nico? Yeah. yeah. Mm. Interesting how you missed that important piece of information by following an addiction. <laughs> can you see that? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I don't like it. <laughs> oh, you don't like it. <laughs> And why could I guess that was your next line? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, the reality is this is the problem with following our addictions, is that we do miss out on many important things by following our addictions. Our addictions lead us away from other things. And this is a good illustration of that for you, just to let yourself sink that into yourself. Every time you follow an addiction, you're going to miss out on something else happening that's going to be loving. And this is some, a basic principle of addictions we need to realise. Well, I feel that's uh, enough, is it, to discuss? It's enough to give you something to go on for those of you who are wanting to be involved in such a project? Is that enough to discuss? Many of you... Nothing burning. You don't have any burning... Certainly. Um, we want to, within the next few months, do that. Uh, we are very f focused, myself and Mary, uh, probably more myself than Mary. Uh, Mary still has some fears associated with the issue. but um, I have a really big fear that we'll get this wrong and then everyone will go, it's all lies and they'll give up on their relationship with God and the whole thing. You know, This is my like irrational kind of fear 
that is blocking me a lot. Mary's worried that if things have gotten wrong with the uh, earth change <laughs> subject, which is actually for us a very minor yeah, subject. Yeah, I feel it's about God and this is amazing yeah. and truth and love and growing at my soul. And then I feel like there's this side issue, which is earth changes. Which and we get asked about quite frequently, but for us it's very minor. Yeah. Um, and I have this fear that if we say stuff about earth changes that doesn't come true, everyone will go, oh, give up on God, give up on emotion, give up. And, and for me, it's like the beautiful thing. <laughs> yeah. So for Mary sort of almost feels a panic arise in her when we talk about um, yeah. earth yeah. change events, for so example. So I'm working on that emotion. Yeah. Yeah. For me, um, I feel whether they come or not, I would love to see 20 or so learning centres around the world. I would also love to see them in the best possible locations for developing people in love and where people are the most open. I also have a very strong feeling of where those locations are. And, um, and so, you know, um, I'm certainly happy to mention many of those locations, but um, I haven't discussed them very openly at this point because nobody's really asked, ironically. Um, people are so focused on what's going to happen with earth changes, what's going to happen. In other words, most of the time they just focus on what's going to happen to me and my life and my town and my, life and my country. That's all they really want to know. Whereas I'm looking at, no, um, I'm looking at the world as a complete whole, looking at where do we want to have centres that are going to have a... Uh, and so any considerations I make about earth changes are really not about earth changes themselves, but where do we want to have centres? What locations do we want to have centres in that I feel are going to be long-term locations with large benefits to humanity you know, in the, in, the, in the mid to long term. When I say mid to long term, within the next five to ten years, short, I feel is sort of more short term. And then mid to long term, sort of ten years plus to 50 years, where is going to be the best, better locations? Mm. And uh, I have very strong feelings about where those locations are. And, uh, and we want to, and I feel um, that we're already beginning to look at some of those locations in these discussions. Yeah. Mm. But there, there is a, a medium um, who's uh, wanting to try and bring specific information about these changes. And, uh, and is willing to go through this process of getting a lot of feedback from myself, which is very, very challenging. And because I do understand a fair bit about earth science as well as science and electronics and other, other issues, um, I can challenge any non-technical information quite rapidly. And that can be quite challenging for a medium. A lot of mediums find as soon as they get challenged, they start shutting down altogether. Uh, whereas uh, um, the medium that we're working with, one of the mediums we're working with, is particularly open to being challenged uh, constantly by my discussion with him. And as a result of that, you know, he's pretty open to, to working his way through the issues. And he's very, very frightened of getting things wrong and so forth. And we're working our way through those particular issues as well. Um, so it's really good process that we're going through. I'd love to go through it with more mediums, but at the moment there's not many mediums I've found. Most mediums I've found can handle me for about 10 minutes of feedback, and then after that <laughs> they start shutting down. So uh, whereas my friend Peter can handle me for quite a number of days without getting into a shutdown condition. Um, so that, that's really wonderful and me me means that he has the capacity to develop quite rapidly as a result. Yep. Um, are there any other questions associated with the subject um, that we want to cover? So everyone understands where we're coming from. We're only giving you this information because of our focus, which is we would love to see divine truth and divine love operational. Uh, when we say operational, the, the truths of divine truth and love on the earth after any events occur on the earth. And we would like to see them in locations which are going to have the most rapid um, absorption of the principles of truth and love. Right? And, uh, and to do that, we are sensitive to the soul condition of different countries and different places on the earth, and we feel quite strongly that there's certain locations at the moment on earth that are very much overlooked by the majority of so-called spiritual organisations, but where we feel there are a large amount of people who want to embrace the principles of love and truth in their lives. And uh, we would love to see as many of those particular places set up with some kind of beginnings even of, a, of some kind of centre with people in those locations before earth change events occur. 
that's how myself and Mary see it. So earth change events for us are basically pretty much of a... Uh, I'm interested in them from a tech, uh, scientific perspective um, and I'm interested in them in the sense of how, um, you know, what areas of the earth uh, will survive and how they'll survive, but I'm not... We're, we're both not very interested in them as a subject for conversation. Um, you know, we feel there are far more... Uh, far many more... Uh, areas of truth we would like to cover with people than this particular subject. However, and, yeah. we do see yeah. that many of you have a desire for knowledge on the subject of a learning centre and therefore mm -hmm. gave this presentation as a result. Yep. Yep. You wanted to say? Oh, just I feel God has designed this amazing system for us. Like we're so used to on earth being uh, intellectually dominant, needing to understand and know through this process of the intellect. And I feel God has designed this other process of um, when we open up to God and ourselves, that we actually absorb truth and knowledge in a far more rapid way and it's more accurate, it's not as labour intensive, it's, it's just a seamless sort of a process and we're guided very naturally, we understand scientific concepts very naturally, mathematics, everything, once we're open emotionally to ourselves. So, um, yeah, that's... I, I think I still have a resistance to even some of the technicalities because I feel like God's the way and yeah, mm. yeah. Mm. So, yep. anyway, thank you very much, everyone, for having us in Greece. Yeah. It has been really fantastic. Yeah. 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 We've enjoyed our stay and uh, and enjoyed as well being able to have these sessions with with all of you, and enjoyed the fact that many people have converged on the location. Yeah? yeah. Karen, would you like to ask a question? Yeah? Yeah. No? Yeah. Just doing things. Yeah. Keep very active. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so we're very, very happy to um, have been invited to come, and we'd like to thank the people who donated for their funds for come. us to come, yep. uh, because we would not have been able to come without those funds uh, donated um, to us. So we'd like to thank you for that. Um, I don't think there are any other things. Just a, there's one or two practicalities we need to discuss before we go. We have a heap of mules, <laughs> if we could choose that too. <laughs> who People who came from Australia with Who have been equipment. carrying some of our equipment um, back to Australia. If you're one of those people... Um, would you be able to please hang around for a little bit while we pack up the equipment appropriately and pack so it nice and tightly so you. you can take it with us? And um, unfortunately, myself, myself, Mary will be able to engage the rest of you, but myself will probably be involved in the wrapping up of a lot of that stuff, so I'm not going to be able to engage you after this session as much as I would normally. Eva, you would like to... And the Greek contingent? Yes. Yeah. No worries. Do you want to let's, use the let's microphone? Let's do that, use yeah. the microphone, yeah. Yes. I would just like to thank, thank you, Karina and Arturo. We've been in your home and you've arranged all this and all yeah. the Greek sisters and brothers yeah. for welcoming the way you have done. Yeah, yeah. so. Yeah. And uh, Arta has been our chef for the, for the majority of our visit, so we'd like to thank you yeah, for that, uh, you guys too. Yeah. Um, we, uh, we hope that you have a lovely trip back home and, uh, and that you consider some of these things and also develop some of these desires now that you feel you have about, about doing things to have the world change. And uh, we hope that you engage some of those desires and passions as soon as you can. There, we realise that there are some heavy spirit influence on you to shut down your passions and desires. And we understand that the, that influence is there. But, but if you consider this one thing, and that is that when you fully engage your desire, you actually become quite unstoppable. <laughs> right? It's very, very hard for somebody to influence you against a pure desire once you have one. So my suggestion is if you find yourselves being influenced by your desires, just deal with the emotions associated with that 
and continue on with your desires because that's going to be what leads you to create what you'll finish up creating in your life in a passionate way. So if you can do that, that would be wonderful. Yeah. We look forward to seeing you again. We're not sure when that will be and we're not sure how that might be accomplished either. <laughs> so, uh, so don't be surprised if one day one or both of us rocks up on your doorstep and we're not even sure whether we might be naked doing so or not so don't be too surprised about that either but uh, just uh, allow allow what happens Do you happens want to explain that comment or just leave it hanging that oh, we no, just I just, we're not sure whether teleportation is uh, possible with your clothes on so, that, so that, that, that's why I make that comment and uh, and we're not sure, you know, we're obviously there's quite a few world events that may happen over the next 12, uh, to 6 to 12 months. Obviously, some of the earth changes will begin to intensify in their... Uh, if we're correct about earth changes, it will intensify slowly over a period of time. And so uh, we may get opportunities to visit again and, uh, and may get opportunities uh, to stay for a little bit of time as well. So... We're not sure what will happen over the coming months. And maybe one of those opportunities, maybe when you guys have got a few options with regard to locations in terms of potential centres, that might be a time for us to come and have a visit again and spend a bit of time with you as well. So yeah. there's all these opportunities that may come up in the future that we, we just don't know yeah. what they'll be. Uh, but we're, myself and Mary have been told by our spirit friends to keep a bag packed at all times. So what that indicates to us is that uh, we may have to just drop everything and next day go somewhere um, to do different things that we wish to do. And uh, that's something that we're becoming more and more used to. So, mm -hmm. so w that probably may happen and you never know when we'll see you next. So we look forward mm -hmm. to seeing you next time. In the meantime, it's been a pleasure to meet you all mm -hmm. sincerely. And it's just it's so lovely for me to feel the qualities in your soul that desire growth you know for your soul and even if some of you are not that even sold on this path there's a desire within you that you you want to grow and and I just think that's a beautiful beautiful quality so yeah. we also it's love the quality lovely. of your desire to investigate yeah explore yeah. explore the desire to explore yeah. so that's really enjoyable yeah. to watch too yeah. thanks for your time thanks guys, guys. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.